Hello, and welcome to the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast, where we empower you with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom. I'm Josh Metal, and I'm here today with Christopher Fontana, co-founder and financial advisor with Florida Medical Advisors, proudly serving clients in all 50 states. Chris, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about your background and how in the world did you land in the financial service industry? That's a great question. Thank you very much. And uh, it's a pleasure to be on here. Uh, so yeah, I started out, um, gosh, 20 years ago, working in finance and actually uh, on your side of things, you know, in the in the mortgage banking industry. And it was um, uh, doing really well, managing a team, more and more production every single year. And then it was around 2005, 2006, where, uh, again, if you've seen the movie, The Big Short, I I, I didn't have any kind of inside knowledge or, or if I had, I'd probably, you know, jumped out sooner, but I started to sense something was wrong. And uh, it was like 2006 and seven where I started to lay the groundwork to move into another type of uh, financial career. And I started uh, exploring and, and getting licenses and so forth to become uh, more on the advisor side than, than on the mortgage banking side. Uh, made the switch entirely in 2000 seven going into 2008. I was at a different firm for a little while, really not focusing on positions. And then as I was sharing with you before, I uh, just had a really good friend, uh, really, really good friend who my wife had introduced me to. My wife is an, an RN. So she had uh, a couple of doctors that she had become friends with working the night shift. And she had said, hey, there's this one guy at the hospital. He's about our age. He likes hockey. You like hockey. You guys should get together. And I'm um, like, yeah, what, what, that sounds just like fun. And he and I became really good friends. And uh, as he graduated from residency and became a doctor in his own right as an attending, uh, he, as we would sit at those hockey games and near admissions, he would say things like, I wish somebody would have shared with me the things that we, the conversations we have about finance. I wish somebody would have told me all this stuff when I was still in my training, you know, before I had the, the income and had made some mistakes. Long story short, he had become he became a client. He then uh, introduced me to some of the other doctors that he works with. He eventually became the uh, chief of his department, and uh, obviously at that point uh, we started doing things with his program on a uh, like an official basis. So we go into residency uh, classes on finance. Uh, we call those financial residencies. Nothing catchy about that. I know it's probably a uh, a lot of people that would use something similar to that. What I uh, like about ours is that it's it's very much meeting them where they're at, and uh, and so that's that's been our focus is helping them to just make. In fact, if you look at the website, help them to make uh, great financial decisions, and and really just making good decisions, right? So when you've got that income, uh, that that's where we started. So that was my start, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, we did it, like I said, for. Uh, you know, a long time now, 11 years, we've been working primarily with medical doctors, dentists, and uh, uh, veterinarians. So those three verticals, uh, we also have a lot of mid-levels because obviously a lot of the doctors will introduce us to their nurse practitioners or their physician assistants that work in their offices or their friends. And uh, so we have a smattering of those as well, but uh, but I love it. Uh, just like you, I like working with uh, a very targeted clientele and, and, uh, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Well, and, and, and Chris, you know, our, our audience is diverse in that it's not all medical professionals and doctors who are going to listen to this podcast, but what I think, uh, you know, we, we definitely have in common is that the vast majority of our listeners are young. They are highly educated. Uh, most of them have uh, relatively high incomes and many of them are highly indebted. And, and, you know, whether you're in the medical profession or another profession, these similar challenges are the challenges that we really want to talk about and, and help you overcome and really become a strategy. Your, your friend was lucky to have you as a hockey buddy and as a financial mentor. So we're going to try and instill all that wisdom of all those hockey games and all those conversations down to a 30-minute a conversation. And I think where I want to start, Chris is you know with our with our average listener or our, our typical listener in mind the millennial that is highly educated and has spent the vast majority of their time and energy really focused on their profession not so much focused on their finances 
and then coming out of school, presumably with a decent amount of student loans. And really the question is like, you know, what, what, are the, what are the crucial things, what's the top advice to give young professionals for their first five to 10 years into their professional career? Where do they start? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, so the uh, the focus, and there's a lot of podcasts out there. Uh, you and I are probably familiar with several of them, but uh, White Coat Investor, you know, I, I hear that all the time, uh, White Coat Investor. And in fact, whenever I do any kind of educational classes, I always ask the attendees, like, how many of you, White Coat Investor, you know, raise your hands. And it's usually about maybe a third of the audience is familiar with, uh, with Dr. Daly's work and his book and his podcast and his uh, website and everything. Um, the focus, typically, they come out of school and a lot of the generic information. So think of it this way. Um, if I go on a diet and let's say that I, it works really well for me to do a keto diet. And I'm like, man, this is fantastic. I lose a ton of weight on it and it worked really well for me. Well, problem is that a lot of times people become an evangelist for that, right? So like, uh, what's that, that? You've probably seen that YouTube video. <laughs> about uh, CrossFit, right? So people do CrossFit, all they want to do is tell you about CrossFit. Um, it's the same thing with finance in the sense that if it worked for me, the inclination is to say it's going to work for everybody. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just not the reality of situation, right? So everybody is different when it comes to their metabolism and things. And it, everybody's different in what they have going on. So obviously, if you're coming out of school and you got three or 400,000 in student loan debt, that creates a scarring, and I, and I don't mean to be over dramatic here, but it does, it creates a scarring, like a mental scarring in the sense that that is such a, an, an, an exor exorbitant amount of money that it, it creates this drive to, no matter what, I want to get rid of that, right? I want to eliminate that debt to the exclusion of other things. So well, one of the first things that I'll ask clients whenever I meet with them for the first time is, you know, tell me what you want to accomplish over the next three years. And it's funny, usually student loan debt is like one of the first things that they'll say, I want to get rid of the debt. Um, but they'll also say things like, I want to buy a house. I want to get married. I want to start a family. Uh, I want to repay my family who helped me with my, in my uh, college experience, right? And, or I want to help my parents out who are you know, in their 60s or 70s and maybe they're struggling financially. And so our approach is that you shouldn't have just a one size fits all. Uh, whenever it comes to your, your objectives and your goals, you really need to have a balanced approach. Yeah. And so if you have a balanced approach, right? So I, I, I use the term and actually I got it from a mutual friend of ours, Daniel Harkavy, uh, who is an executive coach. Uh, Daniel used this term and he didn't use it the same way I do, but I say it all the time, bifocal vision. And so rather than having my eye constantly on the debt, I need to have my eyes uh, bifocal vision. One eye on today, meaning I need to have savings. I need to have some investments started, right? So the sooner you start, the better. But I also need to have my eye on the horizon, meaning uh, I do want to get out of debt and I do want to retire at some point at some time, but I don't want to do one over the exclusion of the other. So bifocal vision, right? So one eye on today, one eye on the future. And, uh, and that's the approach we take with everybody is that you, you need to do both of those things well. And you, you actually can accomplish the elimination of the debt. In fact, uh, you know, most of our clients, not all, but most, are going to be out of debt faster if they utilize uh, the way we tackle it, which is more of a prioritization model, meaning we're going to try to save first rather than make this debt the priority. So I talk a lot about managing the debt. Like, for instance, what you do is you help people get their home mortgages. That's one of the biggest expenses they're going to have. Yeah. If they mismanage that, right? So one of the worst things I, 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 whenever I hear somebody say, we just refinanced the house, we dropped it to a 15 year, that's great. Because they're only looking at the interest that they're going to pay. They're not really paying attention to the cash flow requirement of that change. Yes. And that's uh, oftentimes that's, uh, that's a big problem. I had a vascular surgeon about three years ago now, uh, call me up and announce in my, uh, uh, over the phone, hey, Chris, I'm so excited. I've got a great rate on my student loans. Now, she owed about um, probably around like 320,000 of student loans, which uh, actually in today's environment wasn't that bad, but about 320,000. She, yeah, she's a vascular surgeon though, so she makes really good income. 
And uh, so she tells me I refinanced them and she did it on a five year repayment. So literally the payment was around $8,000 a month. So $8,000 net payment, right? So that's, that's after taxes, she has to pay eight grand a month. Um, shortly after she told me that less than a year later, she was desperately trying to refinance those loans because she had bought a house, got married, and they were expecting a baby. Yep. So because she hadn't thought through all of those future things, and we had discussed them, it's just that she made that decision without actually consulting uh, with our team. And so when it came time to, uh, to actually you know, finish the rest of the planning, she didn't have the cash flow to do these other things. So that was a big concern. So for us, it is really a focus on making sure that we're managing the debt appropriately and that we're not making it the, uh, the priority. I think there's so much wisdom in that, Chris, and I'm going to, I'm going to share a, a little way of a different way of explaining that bifocal vision um, that Daniel uses as a, as an example. There's a friend of mine who drives uh, fancy race cars around a racetrack and he's working with a, you know, a professional race coach and driver. And, and so I'm telling his story here. But he, he, he's pulling, you know, they, he, they're drafting at 150, whatever it is, miles an hour in and out of the curves. And the race car driver says, where are you looking? And he goes, oh, I'm looking at the, the car in front of me's bumper. And he goes, why? And he goes, well, because that's the nearest danger. And he goes, pull over. He says, the problem is, if you're looking at the bumper in front of you, you can't see what's beyond. He says, mm -hmm. now, now, now do me a favor. He goes, he goes, he goes, look, look at that sign back there. He says, do you see the sign? So your focus is way farther down the road. He goes, yeah. And he goes, how many fingers am I holding up? He goes, two. He goes, well, how can you see that if you're looking at the sign? He's like, well, if I look further down the path, I can still see what's closer. He goes, that's right. what race car drivers. And what you just said was, that's what financially successful people do. They, they look beyond the, um, the fear or the urgency, the student loans right in front of them, and they look farther mm -hmm. down that path. That doesn't mean they still can't That's see exactly. the burden of the student loans, but they're looking past what's beyond what's right in front of their face. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's, uh, that's a great analogy. You know, the other thing too, I've heard about race car drivers is that the uh, uh, you know, they say, don't look at the wall. Right. I, I've heard that several times right. where, if the if the driver if they look at the wall you're you're going to go where where your attention is, and uh, yeah that's exactly right. So that's a, that's a great analogy. I hadn't heard that one about the race car before, but uh, but I like that. So I'm, I'm going to steal that actually. So I'll, I'll use that in a future session. But I appreciate that. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Me and you might have to go race some cars together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I have to make sure my life insurance, uh, make sure my life insurance covers that. So uh, <laughs> call your agent, call your agent. All right, look, I, I want to ask you a question about what you said, because we haven't discussed this up until now, but philosophically, we are exactly aligned in that the, the, you know, the, it's easy to be sucked into a 15 year mortgage or, or to sell a 15 year mm -hmm. mortgage because you have a half a percent lower interest rate. But I want to know your opinion and, and what you brought up is that what, what, what people never factor into that equation is the opportunity cost of what they could have done with that additional cash flow over 15 years. And that's astounding if you have just a you know, five or 6% rate of return, that the, the upside right. on the investment is always greater than the lower interest rate benefit. Um, but here's a question I have for you. How do you look at these longer term amortizing debts, which I would say, you know, student loans, mortgages, maybe a practice loan, something I'm talking about, I'm talking about debt that helps you, helps you in some economic fashion. How do you look right. at these longer term liabilities in light of the fact that we seem to be entering an environment that has higher inflation ahead as compared to what we're used to? Does, does, does the future prospect of inflation play into that, you know, wanting to amortize that loan as, as long as possible? Absolutely. And, you know, it's interesting because a lot of the, a lot of the physicians that we work with, 
Um, depending upon when they graduate from their programs, uh, I can get a, I have a pretty good idea of what their interest rate is, right? So uh, everybody, now we're, uh, we're talking right now, you and I, during the age of COVID. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, so they're, uh, most of them, if they have federal student loan debt, they've been paying zero interest for the last uh, year, roughly, right? So President Trump and then Biden uh, just extended that even further. So the, you know, I've had a couple of people say, should I, should I be paying down extra on this because all the payments are going to principal? And then I have other people that are like, well, it's zero. So let me not pay anything because I'm not accruing any additional interest. So let me kind of address your question in, in two parts. So one, obviously the cost of money is going to be important. And so from an economic perspective, what you described is arbitrage. You know, so yes. you, you borrow at one and you invest at another. That's what the banks do, right? So we, we know that, uh, and, and banks do it pretty well. There's uh, lots of banks. Uh, in fact, every time I see ground being broken in my, in my area, you know, my heart sinks when I see that it's going to be another bank going up. Or I'm like, really? Uh, can we get a coffee shop in here or something? But, um, but you know, so, so it's, it's that kind of thing. So we know there's a lot of money to be made in those environments. Um, but the but the issue is, as you said, the opportunity cost. Now, opportunity costs can be measured in in economic terms, like actually my investment may do well, right? May do better. However, there's also what is the rate of return? So let me kind of put it in this. So what's the rate of return of the peace of mind knowing that I have this money set aside? And so with physicians especially, I'll have doctors that say, Chris, I could I could pay cash for the house. I actually have a pediatric dentist, his wife is a dentist as well. They're buying a $1.6 million home in the Tampa area. So they have very good income. They've saved up very well. They could pay cash. And so I had a conversation with him a couple months ago. He's like, should I pay cash? I'm like, well, what's the cost of the money? And, and, and so we looked at it. The interest rate was like 3%. It was, I mean, it's very low, right? And so we, we talked about the, the, the peace of mind that comes with having that much cash available or that much uh, so he is not in the situation. So what is the economic value of not being stuck in a practice that you hate or in a job that you don't like? Uh, uh, one of my clients is a urologist. For probably the last year and a half, he has every conversation with him. He's like, I, I hate where I'm working, hate where I'm working. And uh, I just kept saying, well, well, why are you working there? Like you can go somewhere else, but the job market again during COVID not very never very good for for him to jump ship. So you know we had been saving appropriately, and then you know just a couple months ago he decided I'm going to do it and uh, you know hang his own shingle out there, and, and now he's doing his own thing. But uh, so that's one way of looking at the peace of mind that comes with it. Uh, for me, I always want to help my clients, as you said, with the uh, car uh, racing analogy is is that I wanted them to see a little bit further ahead. So. Uh, your practice may only give you six weeks off uh, with a with a baby, and you want to take 12 weeks. Well, how are we going to bridge that gap? Cash, right? So either you're going to borrow the money, or you're going to you're going to have the cash to do it. Yes, it may not have a rate of return. Money in your savings account is probably earning you zero, or, or very little. So so, but what is the economic? What is the mental rate of return on knowing I can quit this job tomorrow? I don't have any stress associated with it. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is then uh, when I have people that will say, yes, Chris, but my student loan is 500000 and it's 6%, right? So if we start doing the math. We're like, yeah, that's a lot of money that you're paying every single month. But I always go back to the, the you took out the loan in order to have this income that is extraordinary, right? So you're going to make two or three or $400,000 a year. And as a business person, uh, we talk a lot in my practice about balance sheets. Actually, we have a software system that we use that that utilizes a balance sheet approach. And so for a lot of these physicians or dentists or or even like some of the executives that I'll meet that are, are, are the non-medical spouses of my medical clients, they'll say things like, oh, I had never thought about my finances as being like a, a balance sheet, right? They think when I say balance sheet, they think of money in, money out. And I always explain to them that, yes, that is money in, money out is your cash flow, which is very important. But then the balance sheet itself, we want you to think of yourself as a corporation. And a healthy corporation is going to have good assets or good cash flow, but also good assets on the balance sheet. So we want to make sure that you have the wherewithal that if, that if something bad happens like COVID, 
uh, and I've been using that example a lot lately. I don't know what the COVID-24 is going to be or whatever you want to, you know, so something in the future. But I do know there's always going to be something. And so interest rates are low right now. So if I'm a student taking out a loan and I'm looking at, you know, the possibilities of perhaps higher inflation in the future, that money becomes cheaper and cheaper, really. So like if I could lock in the cost, whether it's a refinance on the student loans or the mortgage, uh, I'm encouraging a lot of my clients, not all, but a lot of them to explore, hey, let's, let's, you know, you took out this loan. I know it was only three or four years ago, but you got like 4.5% rate on the 30 year fixed. You know, you might be able to get like a little bit lower rate. We can, we can save up that cash flow. A lot of people have been wanting to do improvements to their properties because they've been stuck at home for, for, uh, you know, 12 months. And so those types of things, those conversations, that's where I want to be involved because those small decisions are going to have very much like rippling effects over, over time. So that's a great question. But hopefully I answered your, your question. Like the way I look at the, the, um, the, the cost of it, the, the opportunity cost, whether what, what, but I like to express it in terms that are not just the financial. There's a lot more to it. No, you answered it great. And you know what I've been thinking a lot about recently after you know, reading um, Buffett's annual shareholder letter where he, you know, he alluded to this, this 40 year period of lower inflation and the pendulum swinging the other direction and, and higher inflation. Yep. Ray Dalio has been writing a series of letters on LinkedIn um, basically, the last one was just saying, you know, you're, you're crazy buying a, I, I can't figure out the logic behind buying a treasury bond at 1.6 when, you know, it looks like inflation's going against us here. And, and, and you bring up the thing of the, the point of arbitrage, and then I'll drop this and we'll let's move on. But here's what I keep thinking about, Chris. If a mortgage is, let's call it three and a half percent today, and inflation goes to five and a half percent. And we assume mm -hmm. that wage growth follows inflation, whether it's direct correlation or there's a lag, what have you. So in my mind, I, I'm saying that's a, that means there's 2% arbitrage, right? Because inflation right. is moving fast, is at a higher rate than interest. So fast forward that 10 years down the road, I'm, I'm, I'm way ahead. I'm 2% a year times 10 years. The value of money is 20% less valuable. So I want to pay that back with $2,031 not two thousand right twenty two dollars mm -hmm. right right yeah yeah so the uh you know and and depending upon what we see with wage growth you know and, and that's the that's the other side of the coin though so that you do have um the increase in incomes with some of these uh some of these medical but a lot of them interestingly enough though josh whenever i talk to them a lot of times the physicians coming out of school very pessimistic you know their idea that uh, gosh, I'm just, uh, wages aren't going up for doctors anymore. I hear that all the time. And, uh, and I like to bring up that uh, I have a client that is a physician, he's a hospitalist, and he works at the veterans uh, hospital that's here in the, in the Tampa area. And so, you know, looking through his uh, social security statement, because he's getting close to retirement now, and I'll point out to these young doctors, I say, look, this, this person uh, this person, uh, hypothetical, I'm just explaining to them, this person, what do you think he was making in 1995? He was a hospitalist. And uh, it's funny because they'll say things like oh, 200,000, 300,000, because they're thinking like uh, he's probably making the same as what he would be making today. And uh, but because in their mind, they're thinking there's been no wage growth. And then I point out to them, I go, he made 90,000. As a doctor, as a hospitalist in 1995, made 90,000. That same salary today is like 250,000. So, what is the increase in the income that this person has experienced? And and then I'll I'll pull up a calculator and I show them the the growth on that. And I say, okay, he experienced you know like a six or seven percent annualized increase to his income over that time frame. Um, even if we're really pessimistic and we just say that your income grows at three or four percent. And you're starting out at a higher number than he is, maybe at two fifty to three hundred thousand, depending upon the specialty. Um, you're going to earn twenty million dollars over your career, and you can see in their minds like it just kind of blows their mind because they had never thought of it that way, right? Because again, all they can see is the student loan like directly in front of them. So the idea of, wow, I'm worth twenty, you know, like I, I like to do that, especially I have a husband and wife. If one of them is medical and the other one isn't, I love it, you know, like like look at look at her. She's worth 20 million bucks. And, and, and 
So we need to make sure that the machine is protected. And, and so let, let's, let's kind of move on to that. Like, how do we make sure that all 20 million of that, which you work so hard for, that you experience and you get, the, you get all of that growth? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the simple question is, if you've got a fixed dollar amount of student loans and a fixed interest rate, do you want to pay it back at the $90,000 salary? Or do you want to pay it back when right. you're earning the 220000 Because the, the, right. the, the cost of money, which is the interest rate, is fixed on that longer amortized student loan, let's assume. But the value of money is variable. And the more inflation that we have, the lesser value of money. And all day long, I want to pay that student loan back when I'm making 220 versus 90. So that I think that yeah. was a really, really valuable takeaway, a couple of valuable takeaways there. So thank you so much. I want to move on yeah. to, to COVID, um, and the pandemic. And I know, I know that medical professionals, nobody was excluded from this pandemic, right? Um, I mean, everybody no. was in one way or another, some more than others, certainly. But, but you know, I own a medical office building. It's a, it's a 48,000 square foot building full of dentists and pediatricians and oral surgeons and orthodontists. And I walked into that building in, uh, I think it was April of last year, and there was not one car in the parking lot. You know, this is this is a huge, huge building. And usually it's it's you know, I can't find a place to park. And we're you know, we're we're looking at the restaurant next door for parking. And there was not one single patient or 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 doctor or medical professional in there. And that was because there was a there was an order in Utah that if you weren't directly on the front lines working with COVID, that they'd suspended all other medical related practices for the month. I think it was the month of April <clears throat> last year. And, and then, you know, obviously they went back to work a lot faster than if they were in the restaurant business. But, but my point is we all were abundantly aware that there are risks that we hadn't been thinking of and we needed a little bit more liquidity at our fingertips than maybe we thought we needed. And so I just wonder going through this experience yourself, how did that impact your financial advice to the, the people you advise and serve? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and, and you're exactly right. Nobody was uh, immune to it. Now, and it's interesting because there was a uh, some of my clients, like the pulmonologists, right, dealing with the patients that were going on the ventilators, they were working more than ever. Right. Um, and then, but they were also exposed. I had several that tested positive for the virus early on. And again, a year ago, you get that positive test on the virus, and you're like, is this person gonna gonna die? Like, you know, because we all saw the horrific things happening. Yeah, you didn't know, right? So we saw what was happening in, in Italy and then China and young people succumbing to the virus and so forth. So early on. When everything is, was shut down, um, I had I had a lot of people. I had the surreal experience that a, a dermatologist called me up, and a great girl. She had just graduated the the previous July or June. Started to work in August. New practice. Everything's going really good. Like all these dreams and things that she wants to do. And then she uh, uh, they call everybody in last March, probably about a year ago, pretty soon here. Called everybody in last March office is being shut down. You're all furloughed effective Monday. It did this on like a Friday afternoon. So she calls me up Friday afternoon. What does furlough mean exactly? <laughs> like what, 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 ex coming what exactly are they? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, what does that mean? And I said, well, you, you, you don't have a job. She's like, but I have a contract. I have a contract that I signed, you know, they're, they're, gar they're contractually obligated to pay me $350,000 a year. And I said, yes, that is true. And uh, uh, but but the reality is that they're shut down. They're not going to be able to pay you. Now, we could you could seek an attorney. You could do all sorts of different things. Um, but in this environment, do you have the time and do you really do you have the energy to do that? I don't think, you know, so I had this real experience of helping this person file for unemployment. You know, so imagine she's got uh, her undergrad, her she did a, a, a public health uh, a master's before she did you know, her residency. I mean, this is a very smart person and she's filing for unemployment, getting whatever it was like 700 bucks a, a week or something. So here in Florida, crazy. Okay. And then, and then I also had uh, uh, the experience of other clients who we had been working with for years. And I, and I, I shared with you before, but I'll kind of share the story here. Um, 
uh, probably about uh, maybe three or four weeks into the pandemic when things were you know, really bad and you couldn't find toilet paper anywhere. Uh, you remember those days, right? So my wife calls me, I'm running errands on a Saturday, just trying to pick up some supplies. And, um, and she, my wife calls me and says, hey, I heard there was toilet paper at the Walmart over in uh, Lutz, Florida. I'm like, you know, that's uh, like how crazy. Okay? So I stop what I'm doing and I, I hightail it over there as I'm walking into the Walmart. I get up, my phone looks down and I'm like, oh, this client's calling me. I pick up Saturday afternoon. I'm like, hey, what's going on? They're like, oh, we just had a couple of things happening. We just wanted to check with you. And, and we were just discussing there were a couple of things. His practice had gotten shut down. He's a dentist. And I'm um, talking to him and his wife. And, and so as we're going through everything, I said, are you guys OK? And it was funny because his wife said to me, now she's um, she doesn't work um, outside the home. They got a couple of kids. And she said, I just want to thank you. She goes, actually, she goes, I've been meaning to, to tell uh, him. I won't say his name, but she goes, I've been meaning to tell him, like, I, I wanted to say thank you because uh, he got shut down. The office is closed. We don't have any income. And she said, this has been stressful, but, but not to the point where like, we're actually enjoying the extra time together. We take walks in the afternoon. We're able to do things as a family. And uh, she said, I want to say thank you because we cursed you out during the early part of our planning a couple of years ago, because you were the one keeping us from doing all the fun stuff that we wanted to do. You know, I didn't buy the Escalade and we didn't take the ski trip to, you know, Vail right out of school because you said we got to save first. And then I got pregnant and then, who, you know, all these things that happened. Right. And she said, I just want to say thank you because uh, our friends who didn't do any of that, didn't didn't do any of the saving on the front end. They're really stressed. They don't have any income and they don't have the assets like we we could. And she said on the phone call, she goes, we could we could be in this position for a year which would stink to see our savings, you know, just get, get eaten up. She goes, but we could do this for a year and it's not going to uh, impact us. At least it's not going to devastate us. And uh, I really took that to heart, you know, a couple of weeks later, they were opened back up again. And, and actually uh, he's about to close on uh, his own practice. So like he was an associate before, but that's a great analogy or a great story because those decisions that we make when, when the stress is not there, are going to have long lasting rippling effects across your finances. So the, uh, so me saying to them when he was a D four at the university of Florida dental college and, and he's coming out of school and I'm like, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're not going to pay your student loans off immediately. What? Uh, yep. We're going to save as much as we can 20 to 30% of your income. Are you crazy, Chris? Like, like we're not going to pay the student. We're not going to do that right away. Um, you know, we're going to eventually pay it off. So our philosophy when it comes to all of this is that that saving on the front end. But then when you do reach the point where you're like, OK, I've got the savings habit down. I am completely protected from anything that could devastate my ability to earn. So here's kind of a, uh, a saying that I like to use. And I think it's, it's very important is that all of us, myself included, all of us are going to reach a point where our earned income is going to stop. Yeah. Right. So we're uh, our, you're eventually not going to work anymore. Now, at the point now, it's going to stop because of uh, uh, extended illness, death, uh, loss of a job, loss of a license or retirement. And it's funny because you know, I say sickness or injury, passing away, loss of a job. People go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then I say retirement and they go, I never thought of it that way. Like retirement, I'm volunteering for my earned income to go to zero. So I'm not going to do anything anymore for income. So my assets are going to be responsible for replacing my income. And so, so th that's really important. And our philosophy is let's make sure that all of those things, whether it's tax increases in the future or, you know, uh, a, a, like, like a COVID whatever event that we have resources available. And then what we do is we save. And so typically what, what, what we have our clients do is we put, not only their retirement bucket where they're saving into for future expenses when they stop working by volunteering, but we also have some side funds that we set up. And one of those is that student loan bucket. So when I say we're not going to pay back the student loans immediately, I'm not saying that we're not going to set up a plan to do that. So what we're doing uh, simultaneously, again, by focal vision is, is we're building wealth. We're managing and protecting yourselves from uh, loss of income, but then we're setting up that side fund. I call it a sinking fund. And as a business owner, as a as an owner of your building, 
think about it, like you're probably, you probably have a slush fund set up so that you know that you're going to have to replace the roof on that at some point or the plumbing, or there's going to be air conditioning issues, right? Eventually. So let's do the same thing with the student loans. We set up a side fund and typically between th years three and years six after graduation or when we start working with them, once they are fully earning their income as an attending or whatever their career path is, usually about three to six years after that, that side fund has enough wealth built up inside of it that we actually can pay off the student loans, but we do it in all, one fell swoop. And, and so you're not paying all the interest because you wipe it out. Now, in the meantime, though, COVID hits and you're like, oh, I'm not so worried about the student loans anymore because the president uh, just said that it's zero percent. So I might need that money just to pay the bills. And a lot of my clients did that last year. They used it just to pay the bills. But that same one I just told you about, you know, like I said, six, uh, six, eight weeks later, he was back to work. So he began the cycle over again, replaced the money that they had spent. And here we are about a year, a little more than a year later, and he's about to close on his first practice. And he's only able to do that because of the habits and the things that we set up. So he was able to ride out COVID and he's still going to be put himself in a position where he's going to own his own practice here in, in just a couple of weeks. So if you do it right, and, I, and I, our philosophy, again, it, nothing's foolproof. And I would never say that there is anything foolproof. There's nothing guaranteed out there. Uh, but I, I really feel like our philosophy has been tested in the most difficult of circumstances. Like uh, I shared with you before, uh, COVID was the perfect storm where if, if our philosophy was going to work, then this was going to prove it. If it didn't work, it was also going to prove that it didn't work. And, and, and you know, we've had great success. Nobody lost the practice. Nobody's gone bankrupt. I uh, haven't had any clients, uh, you know, lose their homes or really, if anything, it's just been annoying that they had to eat up some of that savings that they had built up. But if that's the worst you got to deal with in a, in a time like this where it's just crazy, um, then, then fantastic. I think that's a huge win and a blessing for all of us. Yeah, no doubt. You've, you've been blessed and made some good decisions. You know, you, Chris, you, you touched on something again there and you didn't say the word arbitrage, but I want people to understand how important this is. And, and specifically because your financial planning um, advice and strategy is exactly aligned with our mortgage advice and strategy, which is mm. that whenever you can, you can um, borrow at three or 4%, and go over here and invest. You know, if you look at the S and P historical returns over the last eighty years, it's north of eight percent return, depending on you know when you in and when you're out. But it, it, it's it's probably double what the cost of interest is right now. If you look over long term, uh, if we talk about this investment that you're talking about with the client that's buying their own practice and their own their own you know business. If we look back in 10 years and look at what his rate of return on that money is, he, he may be 15, 20, 25, 30, 50% return. The point I'm trying to make is that the arbitrage between the cost to finance and what you can do to invest that capital, when you, when you fast forward that 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, you have a massive advantage if you can borrow low long term and you can invest at a higher rate and, and 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 to put this in perspective you know ask yourself this question why is it that apple raised uh over seven billion dollars in bonds last year it, it when yeah. it, when they're sitting on yeah. whatever it is a hundred billion dollars in cash why is that right it's because they're right. freaking smart and they know that they can take a, a 20 year or 30 year or whatever the length of that bond was at a ridiculous interest rate at 2% and they can turn around and make six or 8% on that money. Do that all day long. Take that. That's just mm -hmm. free money at that point. But, but people in their own household finances don't think like corporations. And that's really what you're helping them to do is to think with that bifocal vision and, and just do exactly what the biggest, most successful corporations in the world do. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. You know, so uh, we, we've been talking a lot uh, lately with clients, you know, keeping, keeping your powder dry uh, for opportunities, because uh, when you do have dips in the, in the market, uh, those are the times when when it's good, but you need to be consistent with it. So uh, for me, like I, I've used the the analogy, I said uh, you want to lock in as many of the costs that you have 
Uh, like for instance, if I could, if I could go to my car insurance company, using the example like that everybody has to pay. So if I could, if I could go to my car insurance company and say, you know what, the amount that I'm paying today, I want to lock in the cost of that that premium that I'm paying for them every single month, and I want I want it to be fixed, okay, for the rest of my life, uh, regardless of what my driving history is or what my kids do or don't do or whatever. I, I want to lock in that cost. Same thing with like you said, the cost of uh, financing a house or the student loans. If I could, if the more fixed costs that I have as my income increases, the delta between you know what I'm spending and what I'm earning is going to become greater and greater. And as you so well uh, you, you you pointed out earlier, is that that future in, increases to the income, I'm able to save more and more and more. And uh, uh, so I I, I, I I kind of started out our conversation by talking about weight loss and how people get stuck with a mindset of this way works more than anything else. But uh, the other the other thing is, is that uh, I, I like to think of it as I'm going to save more tomorrow, right? So even if I'm meeting with somebody who is in their 40s, and I say to them, you need to be saving, you know, 35% of your income, that is like, well, okay, do I take my kids out of private school? Do I sell the house? Do I get rid of the boat? Like, what do we do? I'm like, okay, so so we know that you're going to have increases of income. So let's lock in as many of your costs as we possibly can. So that's your mortgage, that's the car payments, if you have them, um, whatever the case may be, student loans, let's lock in those costs, those hard costs, so that now, as you do get increases in income, RVU bonuses, or whatever the case is, we're able to save more of those. So let's, let's commit to saving what we can today. Great. Okay, I understand we can't, we can't, you know, the kids are there, like, we're not going to take them out of the school that they love. We're not going to sell the house, you love the neighborhood, your neighbors, but let's at least commit to saving more as our income goes up. And that takes diligence. And it takes, uh, actually, honestly, uh, from our perspective, it takes a lot of time from the advisor. Most financial advisors are just about managing assets. If you don't have a quarter million dollars of investable assets, they don't want to talk to you. And, uh, and so that's, that's just the reality of it, right? So if you go to like the big wirehouses, that's what they want. If you don't have that, you go to a call center. And uh, so we've we kind of built the practice around this idea that there's all these other aspects of your life. You come to a financial advisor because you think that I'm going to give you alpha, which is the you know the return of over and above what the market can produce. And realistically, uh, one, no one can predict what the market's going to do. So let's manage the things that we actually have some agency over, some control over. And those things are your expenses. Those things are your decisions. And if you do it that way, you have greater success. And it's a lot more enjoyable, too, from... Like, I don't want to be the person that's trying to predict or, or pick a, you know, a gamble with somebody's investments. We're not going to do that. That makes no sense at all. And no one has done it consistently. So therefore, let's manage the things that actually that we can, we can control. I love that. I think that's really, really well said, Chris. Well, all right, man. I, you know, I, there's about 40 other questions I'd like to ask you, truth be told. Um, <laughs> but, but unfortunately, we are coming to the end of our, our time yep. here. So I think we've imparted some really good wisdom. Uh, I think we've, we're both on the same track that getting into the habit of savings is habitual. And once you start to see those savings grow, it becomes more rewarding oftentimes than, you know, splurging on the shoes or splurging on the vacation because you're seeing success in those actions and don't delay the savings and putting away the nest egg. That's some great wisdom. We talked about the, yep. the benefit of arbitrage and, and taking long-term loans versus short payoffs, especially if you can invest that money elsewhere and, and make the delta between the two. And um, I think we, I think we've dropped some some really good information here. Let's um, let's let's end with with two final questions, Chris. The the first one is, and this is a bit of a curveball for you, but what do you think the? And we maybe already touched on this, but what do you think the biggest mistake you see millennials doing? Let's just say young professionals making uh, when it comes to their money. Uh, you know, that's it's funny as you were asking that question. Um, I would say following the herd. Okay, so uh, let's, let's use a great example. Recent uh, just happened, you know, uh, Robin Hood, right? So the the whole Robin Hood debacle that happened a couple of a uh, couple of well, several weeks ago now. But you know, so there's this herd mentality and the idea that everybody else is doing it, 
So I'm going to chase after that, that same thing. And uh, there's a great uh, Gr Wayne Gretzky quote where he says, you know, you want to go where the puck is going to be, right? So you don't chase after like a bunch of six-year-olds in a soccer field, like all <laughs> running to where the ball is. Okay. So, so I think that's, that's really the thing is, and as a millennial, um, and, and this is hard for everybody because, I mean, I, I was in my 20s at one point, as, as were you, and uh, you, you kind of, you don't really know what you don't know. And, and I think that's wh whatever age you're at. So, you know, in your 40s, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know what I don't know. And then you're getting your 50s and you kind of have an understanding that there are certain things I don't know, right? So with age comes wisdom uh, oftentimes. But, but I would say that, that being uh, humble enough to say, look, I just need some help with these certain things. And, uh, and I don't know all the questions I should be asking. And from a scientific method, you know, a lot of physicians and, and dentists and, and veterinarians, They've, they are used to researching and academics, so they're constantly searching for knowledge. I love that. I love working with millennials because they always ask really good questions, like very insightful questions. And so a lot of times they don't have the, uh, the air of, I've got this all handled, right? Like, like a lot of my 40, 50 something year old clients, when the reality is that a lot of those 40, 50 year olds are absolutely broke. They are, two or three paychecks, missed paychecks away from financial ruin, uh, and, and they're making all kinds of mistakes. And yet their younger counterparts, the millennials coming out of school, are the ones who are actually, uh, they watch their parents through the dot-com bubble. They watch their parents through the housing crash. And they don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. And so what, the, what I find is that they're looking for advice, but too often they sort of just and they follow the herd. Like I said, you know, it's a lot of like, oh, this blogger said that. And so I see a lot of their buying whatever is hot on the market right now without really thinking it through. Uh, so, you know, we do a complimentary um, consultation with everybody that we work with and it's all via Zoom like this. And usually in that first meeting, I just trying to figure out like, is this a good fit? And if it isn't a good fit, no harm. Like we've literally got uh, about 400 clients that we have helped over the last 11 years. We're kind of picky on who we work with. So we want to make sure that, that it's a good alignment uh, philosophically, because if it isn't, you know, it'd be like trying to walk a, a mile with, a, with an ankle that's out of joint. You could do it. It's going to be really painful. It's not going to be fun. So what we want to do is make sure that there's an alignment. If this person's like, I want to take the most risk possible. I don't want to think about anything bad ever happening to me. That's not a realistic uh, assumption, right? So so every day, unprecedented things happen, right? So how many times have you heard somebody over the last year say, this is unprecedented times, unprecedented times, right? Yeah. Josh, it's, it's precedented now, okay? I mean, like you can stop with the unprecedented because every single day, the mere fact that people say this is unprecedented tells us that, that things that we never thought would happen, happen yeah. every single day. So, so let's prepare for that. Let's prepare as best as we possibly can for the things that we're not even thinking about. And for that, you typically need outside insight. So you need somebody from the outside to just point out, hey, you're missing this. And for this, you know, uh, we're going to help you with these other areas. And, and this, and like I said, you'll, you'll make better decisions uh, overall. And that's going to lead to much more success for everybody involved. Yeah, well said, Chris. I love it. I, what I pulled out of there is is a be humble enough to take advice, um, and and you know as you as you've said, don't follow the herd. If it's an emotional call, if you're feeling emotional to chase something, that's almost always a bad investment decision. Slow and slow and yeah. steady wins the day. All of my best investments have been. Uh, things that I knew weren't going to pay off this year or next year, but in 10 years, this was, this was the right course of action. So I think that was really solid advice. Good. All right. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm very happy with that. I mean, like I said, if, uh, if, um, uh, if your listeners, uh, people on here, like if they have any questions, like you can go to the website that that'd be, that'd be great. Or, uh, you know, hopefully I'd love to be on again sometime here in the future. Love to have you, my friend. Yeah. So let's let's quickly, if you would, leave the website or what's the best way for people to reach out to you if they have additional questions. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, so the website is uh, actually you said it at the beginning. So we're nationwide. Uh, we are a fee based financial planning firm uh, in our website. And again, if I if I had the time machine, like uh, Back to the Future, I'd go back and talk to myself all those years ago. Like, don't use a regional sounding name, but we we did, and we're here. We are. So it's FloridaMedicalAdvisors.com is the website. 
Uh, that's all spelled out, floridamedicaladvisors.com. And uh, on right there on the homepage, you'll see that you can you know, schedule, uh, schedule a meeting and it goes right to my calendar. You get right onto my calendar. If I'm not available, it'll schedule to the, uh, to the next person. But it's really just a couple of advisors uh, and then we have our, our staff. So if you go to the website, you'll see a couple of the, uh, the main partners there, my partner Trip and Seth. But, um, but yeah, so that'd be the best place to go to. There's some information on there, but that's kind of like evergreen information. If you really wanna have a consultation, again, it's complimentary. I'll uh, be happy to uh, schedule something and we, and we could do that. But we're uh, fee-based, fiduciary perspective. So obviously what's in the best interest of the clients, irrespective of what, what, would, what we would be gain from it, that's really important. You wanna make sure that you have an advisor that is a fiduciary and then uh, uh, making sure that uh, you're paying for the advice that you need and it's gonna help you long-term. So be happy to help anybody on the call. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate you sharing so generously with us and sharing your time with us. I know it's a busy season for you, my friend, and look forward to having you back in the future sometime. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for listening to the Infinite Financial Freedom Podcast. Subscribe to us on Apple Podcast and Spotify to be notified of all future episodes and follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. If you'd like to learn more about Neo Home Loans and how we empower home buyers with financial literacy and guide you on your journey to financial freedom, visit neohomeloans.com.